Today is the 22nd of October, uh, 2015. We're at the New York State Military Museum. Uh, my name is Wayne Clark. Sir, for the record, would you please state your full name and date sure. and place of birth, please? Roy McDonald, to Troy, New York, April 12, 1947. And did you attend school in Troy? I did. I attended the Lansenburg Public School System, uh, which was in the northern part of the city of Troy. Mm -hmm. And what year did you graduate from high school? 1965. After graduation, did you go on to college? Went on to college. Went on to SUNY Oneonta and graduated from there, and then I went in the Army. And what year was that? 1969. Where did you go for your basic training? Uh, Fort Leonard Wood, Missouri. And what was that like for you? They call it Little Korea because it was very wet and cold, and they were right. Mm -hmm. <laughs> I, I, it was what I expected, mm -hmm. and uh, uh, from there I went on to Fort Sill, Oklahoma, where I spent quite a bit of time uh, uh, in training all aspects of uh, fire bases and you know artillery uh, duties, and I ended up, uh, when I went to Vietnam, being a forward observer, an artillery forward observer. And what was your MOS? Uh, 13 Echo 20, which was uh, field artillery intelligence and operations. And when did you go to Vietnam? In July of 1970. I got there. Uh, the uh, <clears throat> Cambodian invasion was coming to an end, uh, and my, my unit that I was assigned to the division was the 1st Air Cavalry. I was with Charlie Troop 1st and the 9th Squad uh, Cav. Mm -hmm. and, uh, they were an air mobile infantry unit, and I was part of that operation. And when I was there, uh, we were in Phuc Phen, uh, which was a, a base not far from the Cambodian border, and we spent a lot of time in Tay Ninh, and then we worked the border up and down, and then uh, in the fall, uh, there was another invasion of Cambodia by the Arvin, the South Vietnamese Army. And we were supposed to support them, and we went up there and we were supposed to stay in the border, but uh, we spent a lot of time going over the border. Uh, mm -hmm. It was difficult to see where Cambodia started and stopped, so uh, uh, I remember uh, uh, with my unit uh, on a dirt uh, road where our helicopters had, uh, you know, uh, landed, uh, and uh, we got some mail uh, given to us. And I remember reading in the newspaper, uh, the, the newspaper was the Troy Times Record, and that's Troy, New York, where I'm mm -hmm. from. And I, I used to deliver that paper when I was a little kid. I remember the headlines where the government denies that there's any soldiers in Cambodia. And I was reading that to my friends, and of course we were sitting in Cambodia at mm -hmm. that time. Uh, and my comments were, we're not here. You know, <laughs> evidently we're not here and they don't care. Now, were you under fire at all during this period? Yes, uh, th there was. <clears throat> Excuse me, uh, there were several occasions, I wouldn't say several, but uh, you remember them. Uh, it started uh, uh, when I was with the 1st and the 9th uh, Cav uh, at their base camp. They had a good reputation for, uh, you know, in enemy engagements. And we got rocketed and mortared, uh, you know, about four or five mm -hmm. times a week, maybe couple times a day and sometimes as little as one or two uh, rounds and sometimes as much as maybe 15 and that uh, hurt some people and uh, you know uh, it was always something uh, you had to be aware of generally speaking it was at night or early in the morning mm -hmm. and uh, you didn't want to wander too far from the sandbag bunkers that we were living in. Any close calls for you personally? Yeah well I, w I would say uh, on occasions uh, through my own ineptness, okay, I exposed myself to uh, enemy fire. I remember uh, the worst period of time I had there was um, on Christmas Eve uh, of 1970, mm -hmm. and um, it was supposedly the next day was going to be some armistice, you know, uh, some uh, 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 agreement with the uh, Vietnamese, North Vietnamese, and the Viet Cong that there would be no shooting because of Christmas. And we had loach duty, that's light observation helicopters. And they would, uh, uh, you know, and I was part of this periodically, uh, uh, they were uh, observers, uh, you know, and they were scouting around our, uh, our position uh, by the small helicopter and 
people in their duty looking for any possible any enemy movement, which was common. Usually they worked with a, a Cobra gunship mm -hmm. and they called them hunter killer teams and mm -hmm. pink teams and white teams with the blues, the blues with the infantry. And uh, the uh, thing that was most relevant about that day is that uh, uh, they had had a drawing very early in the morning, you know, as soon as the sun came up. They found out that uh, they were going to take a helicopter, uh, you know, about 10 guys from my unit and drawing from the Army, on Army helmet, uh, names of uh, the guys in the unit who would go to see Bob Hope mm -hmm. the next day down in, uh, I think it was Long Bend. And they would, you know, fly you down and fly you back. And, you know, we had more than 10 people in the unit. I, I guess we had, you know, in, in Charlie True First of the Night, maybe, you know, 40 or 50 people. And uh, I remember I wanted to win that, <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. go sure. down and see uh, Miss America and all the, you know, people that he had. And I didn't, you know, somebody else just pulled the name and that was it. And then before you know it, uh, a fellow named Buchanan, who was a friend of mine, uh, uh, a good friend of mine, Greg Peffer, uh, one was an infantry sergeant, Peffer, and, and Buchanan was a helicopter pilot. We, you know, we're mobile, so that means everything we do is helicopters. And it was always difficult for me because I don't like heights. Mm -hmm. So hanging out of a helicopter uh, was not what I enjoyed. Uh, I finally got used to it, but uh, never really liked it. And uh, Buchanan went out and he, he had just switched from flying from Huey's, now he's going to fly flight observation helicopters, Lotus, and it's a three-man, you know, helicopter, and it's small, and it's got a, a plastic bubble so you can see, substantial, and, uh, you know, it's dangerous, and we were kidding him, you know, because life expectancy and things like that were, and, uh, you know, he shrugged it off and smiled, and he's a good guy, I think he was from Indiana, and he was a warrant officer, good guy, and uh, he, uh, he, you know, Walk by our bunker, you know, and him and his team took off. And it was going to be an easy day for us. And, mm -hmm. and Peffer, my buddy, uh, uh, had taken and won one of the tickets to Bob Hope. Mm -hmm. So he said he didn't want to do anything that day. He was resting up to see all those beautiful women that Bob Hope <laughs> was bringing over. And uh, so, about an hour or two after Buchanan had, you know, walked by our bunker. And to get into the low helicopter, uh, uh, you know, you know, we get alerted that a helicopter, a down bird, uh, is what they call it. Uh, and uh, we turned around and we had to uh, uh, go out there. They were shot down. They were doing very low level observation, and somebody, you know, shot them. Uh, we're assuming it's a VC auto automatic weapon, it's like AK 47s. Mm -hmm. And what it did, it was pretty much heavy jungle. And the, the helicopter uh, 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 didn't hit the ground, but uh, they lost control and they caught on fire and they were uh, up in the trees. So, you know, we were alerted and, uh, you know, we worked on the premise uh, of, uh, you know, infantry and uh, the helicopter crews and sometimes it was a changeover. And guys like me, the artillery forward observer, would someday be in the helicopter, someday be with the grunts on the ground. Uh, or someday turn around and be in the helicopter, you know, given support from the air, and then put on later. So I was in the first helicopter, and that was a new experience for me. Uh, it was the uh, first time I was ever in the first helicopter, which always means a significant thing to me. Mm -hmm. <laughs> which means you're the first ones there, you're the first ones that are going to jump out, and if it's a, you know, a hot LZ, landing zone, you're going to be the targets. So that was uncomfortable, and I thought in my mind, I got two choices. I could sit in the middle of the helicopter and be one of the last ones out, or, uh, you know, I could try to get uh, on the edge sitting in the seat and, uh, you know, be one of the first ones out. So I was on the edge uh, of the helicopter. They had no doors on them hanging out. And then I realized just how uh, nervous I get at heights. So here we are. We're coming into a, a landing zone, and all of a sudden we're taking fire. You can see the tracer rounds coming at us. And they're telling us it's a hot LZ. You know, it wasn't like there was a lot of people down there, but we got we got bullets coming at us, rounds of ammunition, and uh, so we're coming in. And I'm saying, geez, I don't want to. Uh, you know, I'm thinking the negative thoughts. I'm thinking I don't want to die mm -hmm. in a helicopter crash if this thing gets shot up. Okay, they call them crispy critters, the guys who, who burn up in these 
On the other hand, uh, I don't have many options, so uh, it, it was obvious there was no real location to land a helicopter, so you were going to have to jump. And they had the high grass over there, the elephant grass and all that. And I made a, a tactical uh, mistake. I thought the grass was lower than it was. It, it, grew, it was higher than I expected. And I jumped way too soon. Uh, you know, you see one tra tra tracer go by, you get nervous, a couple more. I said, I'm gonna, I want to get on the ground as quick as possible. And here I had the opportunity, and I was gone. And then all of a sudden, it's like walking down the stairs and missing a step. I said, wait a second, this is longer. It's taking me longer than it should to, to hit the ground here. And it didn't. It probably was 10, 12 feet maybe. Uh, and I had not a big pack, but a small pack uh, on my mm -hmm. back. And I just turned my right ankle. Uh, you know, I sprained it really bad. And <clears throat> obviously, the helicopter uh, knew we were taken, and, uh, and you know, in, you know, shots, and uh, and they kind of lowered down, and everybody jumped out of the helicopter, and a few of them jumped right on me. And I was fortunate that one was this guy, Greg Peffer, who was a very good friend of mine, and Peffer grabbed me and uh, dragged me away and uh, set me up, and on the perimeter that you put on a town helicopter, uh, you uh, you get the opportunity to, uh, to you know hold your position and I thought my god I said that you know I broke my ankle and I, if I thought it went through maybe they're gonna send me home mm -hmm. uh, that's the good side the bad side is it really hurts and so uh, throughout the day they were trying to get to the helicopter in the, in the trees the loach and it was not a, not an easy task and uh, finally uh, as it burnt and the ammunition in the helicopter was you know uh, blowing off uh, it kind of went down, you know, to different branches closer, and, and uh, they were able to get, you know, by climbing part of the, the trees, you know, some of the guys, which were all dead. Mm -hmm. And I remember it was still up there. They put a, uh, uh, a Buchanan, who was my buddy, in a, in a uh, you know, one of those uh, waterproof... Uh, bags and sure. uh, they dropped them down the body bag which nobody wanted to even say the words body bag and he melted through the body bag and uh, by then I'd been on the ground maybe you know six or seven hours and here I thought I had a broken ankle and it was really severely sprained and I was very grateful I was dragging my foot along and I got closer uh, to the action and all of a sudden I got there just when uh, you know Buchanan's uh, body bag had opened up because the, you know, uh, the heat from the white phosphorus that was in his body and everything, and he just splattered all over the ground, and you know, this is the guy that was my friend, mm -hmm. that I was talking to two, three hours before that. That was a tough one, and uh, we got out of there, uh, and uh, Christmas Eve will never be the same for me, and uh, uh, showed that uh, some of these guys are just amazing heroes, uh, that do that, did that kind of stuff every day, mm -hmm. and I remember uh, the next uh, when we got back to our base camp, that uh, uh, my friend Peffer, who was close to me, stayed in the same you know sandbag bunker together. He was from uh, Illinois, good friend, and uh, he was so upset. He says, "Listen, I'm going to give you my Bob Hope ticket. I don't want to go." Uh, to Long Bend, and I said, well, you know what, uh, I don't know if I can go with a bad foot, <laughs> okay, mm -hmm. so, uh, uh, you know, things uh, uh, got real bad, and uh, a couple weeks later, uh, uh, I was on, uh, in January, I was on my R&R, &R, and when I was gone, my good buddy Peffer was killed in a oh, firefight. Geez. So, you know, you look back, and I don't think I've ever been anybody more brave than, than personally, I, I'm sure some of these soldiers, but, you know, I was just an average soldier, but I, w I was with some guys that, that went through the, the original Cambodian invasion, and, you know, mm -hmm. they were just tough guys, but, you know, more importantly, they were, they were just good guys. So, and how old were you? I was 22, 23 mm -hmm. in that time frame. And what rank were you? I was an E5 specialist, fifth class. Mm -hmm. and. Uh, you know, I'll tell you, uh, we're very fortunate uh, uh, to have all those, uh, you know, uh, soldiers, Marines, Air Force, Navy guys serving in Vietnam because nobody cared when they came home, but nobody realized what they went through. Mm 
Mm -hmm. And some of these guys were just tremendous heroes. And I think that's true even today. Uh, we'll never understand truly what the men and women in Afghanistan and Iraq have gone through. And I'm just uh, proud to be a part of it, you know, mm -hmm. and, and proud to have known these people. And, you know, eventually I went home and the, the highlights for me were uh, Christmas Eve will always be in 1970. Uh, just the amazing, uh, uh, you know, a day mm -hmm. that to most Americans, myself included, is a sacred day. And they have all, and I never saw it coming, and uh, you know, mm -hmm. it's uh, it's amazing. Now, when did you leave the army? Or, I mean, when did you leave Vietnam? Well, I, I served my year. I left in July or late June of uh, 1971, and the last couple of months things were slowing down dramatically. Mm -hmm. They had more action uh, up in the northern part of Vietnam with the 101st and the Laos. And the Arvins were going into Laos, uh, like we went with the Arvins into uh, Cambodia. And I think uh, we were hoping, anyway. You know, they teased so long, but uh, you know, it still it still went on for another three or four years. Mm -hmm. Okay. Uh, it certainly, uh, uh, I think, the American people uh, today have realized in their outlook toward the American military, that uh, good war, bad war, uh, doesn't mean, you have the right mm -hmm. to challenge it because we're all American citizens and you have that uh, ability to say, I want to disagree, I want to bring up some argument. I think that's healthy. But not to overlook that the men and women in the military are doing their best and they're not making decisions, they're just being told what to do. And so uh, care about the soldiers, care about uh, all the military personnel, and debate wars, that's I think what America's about. And then when mm -hmm. the decision is, is made by the majority, support that decision. Because you don't want to give the enemy any kind of uh, you know, opportunity to say, well, I don't think you people are organized. Mm -hmm. And I think uh, a foreign policy should stop at mm -hmm. the end of our, uh, our country before we go overseas. And, uh, and you know, people make mistakes if it's the bad decision. You know, pull back, do something else. But uh, never, never, ever again let the soldiers hang out there. And the Marines and the Air Force and the Navy, the military personnel in Vietnam, hang out there. Never again let them do that. It's immoral. And, and, and the point is, a lot of that stuff, there was a lot of rich people that didn't serve in mm -hmm. Vietnam. There was a lot of special people who had political you know, uh, uh, leverage they get out of it. And I think, yeah, morally, everybody should serve. Mm -hmm. And that'll shorten the wars or even eliminate some wars, because that's not what you think it is. It's ugly, and it's dirty, and uh, uh, you want to question it. And when you see people, who, you know, American soldiers die, it, it's a bullet to your heart, because that's somebody more than likely you knew. Or if you didn't, you had a pretty good understanding in our culture what kind of life they lived and knowing that somebody home is now, uh, you just wrecked a whole family, not just one person, mm -hmm. a family for generations. Now, once you left uh, Vietnam, did you do any stateside duty? Yeah, I was sent to uh, Fort Carson, Colorado, mm -hmm. and uh, they had moved the 4th Infantry Division there, and I went out was a part of the 4th Infantry Division. And it was a nice assignment. Uh, Colorado Springs is where it's located. I learned how to ski out there. And uh, after that, uh, I ended my Army tour. And uh, when were you discharged? Uh, April of 1972. Did you make use of the GI Bill? Yes, I did. I got a master's degree in the GI Bill. OK. And uh, the one thing that disturbed me, though, I used the educational component. But when I was a kid, my dad was in World War II, and I remember he bought a house at a very, you know, significant uh, lower interest rate in the mortgage than that they were offering to Vietnam veterans. Mm -hmm. And even today, there's a disappointment with the uh, Vietnam, excuse me, the Veterans Administration Hospital and Healthcare. Okay, you see across the United States. So I guess what I'm saying uh, is I've seen a decline in the benefit package that was offered to the World War II people, and justifiably so. The GI Bill may be one of the greatest bills ever passed by the American government. They took care of those veterans. Now, could they have done better? You know, I wasn't around. Mm -hmm. uh, I do know they did well, but I mean, 
in today's uh, world, uh, you have to have, uh, you know, if you're sending people off to fight and die for you, you have to have uh, benefit packages. And let's not kid each other. A lot of these people are from low-income families. I was from a low-income family. So this is not, once again, the rich going. This is just working class people, in some cases even lower than that, people who have nothing. You gotta give them health care, you gotta help them with their housing, you gotta help them with education. You have to help them with any psychological ramifications that they've encountered. That's the responsibility, that's across the war. And it's my observation that uh, Vietnam, they never factored that in. They knew how much an airplane cost or a bomb for a B-52, but they didn't know how much a soldier or you know a military personnel when they came home would cost and, and shame on them. And a lot of those guys never had their sons or daughters over there. If they did, they'd have a different opinion. Mm -hmm. Now, uh, once you got back, you finished your education. Um, I understand you went on into politics, but did you join any uh, veterans organizations, the VFW? The oh, I've been a, uh, I'm a member of the VFW in Saratoga Springs and mm -hmm. the American Legion in Saratoga Springs, and I have been probably I don't know, maybe 35 years mm -hmm. in that capacity. And where I grew up in the city of Troy, in the neighborhood I grew up in Lansenburg, they have a Veterans Association, and I'm a lifetime member of that as well. Uh, as a public official in the New York State Assembly and the New York State Senate, I asked to be on the Veterans Committee, and I offered several veterans bills. The ones uh, specifically were Patriot Plan 1, 2, and 3, and they included a whole variety of things that the state of New York could do, uh, educational benefits on top of uh, uh, the benefits you get from the federal government. Mm -hmm. And one of the things that was a problem was that, as we know, in the more modern wars, Afghanistan and Iraq, the Persian Gulf, the, in general, the war on terror, uh, a lot of the National Guard units are being used. And, uh, you know, at any time, half the soldiers out there are men and women from the you know the National Guard uh, uh, of the country, and a lot of the benefits in the past weren't offered till you were already a veteran. <coughs> Excuse me, and the uh, the legislation changed. <coughs> Sorry, the legislation changed uh, that to make uh, you know uh, even though you're a full-time career man in the National Guard, you would have the capacity to turn around and get your benefit package mm -hmm. once you've served in those uh, theaters uh, with a DD-2, you didn't need a DD-214 like a regular veteran would have, you would have an in, in, in service. So you would get property tax exemptions in the state of New York for veterans and you didn't have to you know, wait till you get out of the military. I think that's important. I think that's very important. One of the bills I did, I was with a state senator from Long Island who had just come back from Iraq uh, before he got elected to the state senate, and we did a bill, uh, uh, a peer group bill, uh, and basically the bill dealt with people with psychological problems, uh, post-traumatic stress disorder, and uh, a, a, a wonderful program, peer group uh, program based upon police departments in Long Island, which are very large and uh, made up of a lot of National Guard people who are also full-time cops. So uh, it provided services and help for them. You do what you can at the state level. Unfortunately, uh, you're only a state. The real issues have got to be addressed by the federal government. Mm -hmm. Now, did you stay in contact with anyone you were in service with? Yes, I did. I, I still have friends. Uh, I have a good friend in Wisconsin and a good friend in Denver, Colorado, that uh, served with me in the first CAV. Uh, and uh, a couple others I stayed in contact. Some of these people have passed away. and. Recently, this past year, I visited uh, Fort Hood, Texas, which is now the home of the 1st Cavalry Division. And uh, I went to their reunion. They have an annual reunion, mm -hmm. which was a great time. So uh, it's a little different in today's you know, world sure. because people rotated. You didn't go over with a unit in Vietnam, generally speaking. You were a replacement, and uh, you, know, you had your 365 days. If you were in the army, you had one year, and after that year, it was uh, you know you moved on. Mm -hmm. and some people went home, but uh, you know uh, I did uh, serve in the first cab. That's a big division, 
And when I was there, the two biggest divisions and the ones that sold the most action, generally speaking, and I shouldn't say that because it was all the older divisions had their share of action, but the first cab and the 101st Airborne were uh, a primary divisions. And uh, a lot of the guys that went through training with them in Fort Sill, Oklahoma, ended up in fire bases. And when I was an FO, I used to go to the fire bases. These were all first cab fire bases looking for the, the people uh, with the 105 howitzers. Mm -hmm. See if I uh, had any guy I went through training with, and I, I ran across two or three, and it was gratifying. I had photographs of them, but uh, we're all getting older. Definitely. All right, in closing, is there anything else you'd care to add? I uh, think you pretty much covered a I, lot of ground. Uh, I think that the American public's going in the right way from the standpoint of respecting the veterans, and I'm proud of what they're doing. And the next step would be to make sure that they continue to do that. Uh, and how you do that is to make sure the health care is good for these veterans today. I'm not talking about my era. I'm talking about future era of veterans. Mm -hmm. And uh, uh, I've had this wonderful opportunity to be involved with veterans groups and public uh, you know, policy and veterans. <clears throat> Our freedom is based on how the people are willing to fight. And it's the truth is that... You know, the reason we're free is because the American military is made up of average people to align in the sand and says we're going to be free. Well, thank you so much for your interview. Thank you.